Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here. My name is Laura Lyles. I am the president of the Natchitoches Area Chamber of Commerce. I especially want to thank our candidates for being here. Thank you for running for this office and participating in all of our activities for this evening and with our questionnaire. I also want to say a special thanks to our NSU Student Government Association. All of our SGA students are here supporting the event tonight as our sponsor and um, helping us proceed through the evening. So thank you very much for that. Um, I do want to kind of just explain a few things before we all get started so that everybody knows how this is going to work and uh, what we all have set up for the evening. So our candidates all the three of you who are here tonight participated in a questionnaire that was sent officially through certified mail from the Chamber of Commerce and they all turned in their questions on time appreciate that very much so for those of you who are here in the audience tonight or those of you watching online through our live stream you can see their um, answers at Natchitoches slash candidates respond if you're here with your smartphones you may want to go check those answers out to um, make an informed question for our candidates this evening just to see what they're running on and um, form informed questions for our candidates so I encourage all of you at home um, or here in the audience tonight to go check out Natchitoches slash candidates respond we do have a few general rules as I mentioned to go for before we get started so we're all on the same page this forum, as I mentioned, is being streamed live. You can see that at our website, nakedishchamber.com slash live stream. Again, we appreciate the SGA for sponsoring tonight and the, all of the many individuals who came together to pull this event together. There are a lot of moving parts to an event like this, um, and we just appreciate all of the individuals who helped put, us to get, put this together with us. And on a personal note, all of our SGA students who are here tonight, can you all raise your hand so everyone knows that you're here? I want to thank you all personally and say that we hope to see you all on a stage like this at some point in your lives. This is very important and appreciate your uh, civic duty and civic responsibility in helping us out with the chamber and with our candidates forums. Um, for those of you in the audience, now would be a good time to silence those cell phones and I will do the same. For the forum itself, each of our candidates will be given three minutes to speak on questions three and four from the questionnaire that was mailed from the chamber. We again have SGA students here. Um, they're on the stairs on either side and they're going to be collecting questions from the audience. After our candidates have their three minutes to speak on both of those questions, uh, we'll move into questions from the audience. Those will be directed from the SGA students down to our Chamber Board of Directors here at the front table. And uh, they're going to just help us with the validity of those questions and the organization of those questions to make sure that we get through things in a timely fashion. And um, um, organize things. We will end promptly at 7.30. So um, again, each candidate will have three minutes for the questions from the audience as well. So um, they'll be organizing those and bringing them up to me and questions will be asked um, through myself as the moderator. So um, if you all would please think of those questions ahead of time and make sure that you get them in before our candidates finish with their introductory three minutes. Um, that'll just help us kind of move things along quickly. So I hope that everybody has questions in mind. Um, we've got 
quite a few folks in the audience tonight. If we don't get those questions from you all, this forum is going to be very short, sweet, and to the point. So please ask your informed questions. These guys are prepared and ready to go. I'm sure they wouldn't mind a short, sweet night, right? But uh, we're here to learn from them. So please get those questions in to our table at the front through the SGA students. Um, for our candidates, just to remind you of the two questions that you'll be reading for your first three minutes. Questions three and four from the questionnaire. The first is what professional experience and training do you have that would make you the best candidate to effectively manage the Natchitoches Parish Sheriff's Office? And two, what changes would you make in the Natchitoches Parish Sheriff's Office if you were elected sheriff? Let's see, make sure I don't forget anything else before we get started. I think that is everything we were going to cover. So, um, oh, there's one more thing. We've got uh, two SGA students sitting in the front as well. They are going to be helping us keep time. So um, here's how this will work. We've all got three minutes for every question, as I've said many times. Um, they are here to give us a warning whenever we have reached our two-minute mark. That yellow card is what's going to be our um, notice that we have reached our two-minute mark and we've got one minute left to wrap it up. And then the red card means that we're done. The three minutes are up. So I know that you all will be very respectful of that. I, sorry. If I need to remind you that the red card has been uh, shown, then I will be happy to do that so that we can move on to the next candidate. And again, just keep things rolling as the evening goes on. You guys are seated in alphabetical order, so I think we are ready to get started with that. We will start with Mr. Steve Pizant on his three minutes. Um, guys, you'll just time him as soon as he starts talking, and then uh, we'll go from there. Any questions? You can answer it in either, either order, but just as long as you cover them both, you'll have three minutes to answer both, both of them collectively. Yes, sir. Any other questions from the candidates before we get started? Okay. You guys are going to be speaking from this podium to my right. Um, one more uh, reminder for you all to speak directly and clearly into the microphone. That's going to help all of our folks in the audience tonight as well as those watching through the live stream. Okay? All right. Let's get started. Mr. Steve Pizan. Good evening. Thank y'all for having us tonight. Thank the Chamber, Northwestern, the SGA. Um, thank everybody that showed up for this and those watching by internet. As said, I am Steve Pizan. I'm a candidate for sheriff. I want to be the sheriff because the whole 26 years I was a Louisiana State Trooper, I've watched the sheriff's office answering calls with them and grew up and grew with the people working for the sheriff's office. And it's important that we stay together and, and train and go together. Um, and question number three, I do have two years, two degrees from Northwestern State University. I have one from Southwest Mississippi Community College. You got 26 years as a trooper. Uh, all over the signs right here in Nicholas Parish. I've been on the road and patrol the entire time. Um, as an experience with the budgets, I want to do a lot with it because we, we have a, and, and the budget's $17 million somewhere in that. There's a lots of things that can be done with that. I want to put more deputies on the road get technology get the technology up to date and make it to where you're safe in this parish want to be able to go to your house and when you leave your house not have to worry about things i, I tell you it's been a long seven months um it's coming to an end early voting starts excuse me early voting starts saturday runs through the following Saturday, and of course, the election is October the 12th. Keep in mind that, that it's very important that you get out to vote because it is something that we all have right to do that they can't take away from us. So please remember that on October 12th, vote number 77, Steve Pizant for sheriff. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rashel, you'll be up next. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Hello, how's everybody doing tonight? My name is Steve Rashel, running for sheriff, candidate number 78. It's a privilege to be here with, with everyone, uh, and, and like Steve said, with people tracking it on the internet and Facebook and Channel 12. Uh, I began my law enforcement career 34 years ago. I put my uniform on for the first time as a part-time deputy here in Natchitoches Parish. I uh, did that for a few months, got hired by the city police, and I've got to talk fast three minutes ago pretty quick. <laughs> Got hired by the city police uh, here in Natchitoches. I did a, about a year there. And then Norm Fletcher called me one day and offered me a, a job at the sheriff's office. So I took him up on that. I worked in the uh, criminal division for four years. I was a recovery scuba diver for the sheriff's office during that time as well. Um, state police were hiring. I put in for that. 1,600 applications is what I was told. They hired 85 of us statewide. I was one of those 85. Uh, did 21 years as a trooper. Nine years I worked patrol as a resident trooper here in Natchitoches Parish. And in the last 12 years, I was an investigator and a supervisor with the state police. I ran four different sections as a state police sergeant. I ran the gaming section for just a little while, a few years actually, uh, which was a regulatory oversight of the casinos, uh, dealing with the uh, mass amounts of money that came through there and criminal investigations on those boats. Um, also, uh, uh, a little while later, uh, uh, the colonel called me and offered me a position in a special crimes unit. That was the internet predators, identity theft, so cyber crime is something I'm not uh, a stranger to. From there I went to regular detectives because they blended those two sections together and I, did, I ran the detective section uh, for quite a while, working homicides, working uh, uh, public corruption uh, and, and those kind of cases. And then uh, toward the end of my career, a vacancy came up in uh, intelligence. I always thought, I thought that'd be a pretty nice uh, way to end my career, so I put in for it, six of us applied for it, and I was uh, picked. I worked three years basically undercover in intelligence. I was a SWAT guy for eight and a half years, and I was on the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force as a, as a, as a trooper. Uh, after I retired from the state police, I went back to the Marshals, went through a four-month investigation, got hired as, uh, to protect federal judges. I could go on, but I need to get to the other part of this. Uh, as, a, as your next sheriff, I want to change some, uh, some things here. One thing I want to do is establish true resident deputies. We used to have that. We had deputies that worked areas that actually lived in those areas and knew everybody. I could drive down any road in my zone, which was the west zone, and could tell you who lived in every house in that zone. And I could pull in the driveway and they'd call me by my first name. Uh, we want to reopen the substations. We want to do something about the break-ins and the stealing going on. There's a lot of that going on everywhere right now, and uh, that needs addressed. The drug problem needs addressed. There's so much stuff that needs addressed. We can do that with resident deputies and putting more people on patrol, and Tom. I've got to sit down. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Steve. Now we'll ask Mr. Stewart Wright. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Thank you, Chamber, and I thank everyone for being here today. Uh, my name is Stuart Wright. I'm a candidate for our sheriff in Natchitoches Parish. Uh, the sheriff's office is a $17 million a year business. We have 220 employees. We have probably one of the, the biggest departments anywhere around. Uh, it's very important to understand the whole workings of this uh, sheriff's department. We have nine individual departments. What sets me apart from my opponents are these three things, and I'll be real quick with this. First of all, first of all my formal uh, education. Uh, I graduated from Northwestern State University with a uh, degree in business. From there, I went to LSU Law School where I graduated. I operated a business here in Natchitoches for 32 years, a law practice where I dealt with all types of uh, cases, from simple cases to complex cases. After, uh, <clears throat> after I had uh, I graduated, within five years, I became first assistant uh, DA. And as first assistant DA, it was my job to try all of the major felonies, your murders, your rapes, your robberies, all of your drug cases. And when I say try these and handle these, that's handling these cases from the time they happen until they may end up in the Louisiana Supreme Court where we are argued to, arguing to uh, sustain or, or at least justify the decision that was made. During this period of time, uh, I gained a lot of experience in the criminal law uh, area. Uh, it's something that takes a long time to do. Uh, it's something that, uh, that you cannot just learn overnight. I've applied this to everything that I have done since I have gotten out. Uh, I'm running for sheriff because I believe that since I have been with the sheriff's office the last seven years, I've made a difference with the sheriff's office. 
We have implemented all types of new plans. We brought ourselves up to par on uh, HR, human resources. Uh, I don't think we were where we needed to be, so we hired a human resource person to come in, and he has done a great job, and I think we're almost in compliance with that at this point in time. The, uh, what we, what most people say, well, I will do this if elected. Well, I've been there seven years, and since I've been there several, seven years, I've changed a number of things. I've changed the way that we have handled probation and parole, and these guys that are on suspension, they get arrested for, uh, for new crimes, and they're put in jail, and they're costing us a fortune. I found a way to revoke these guys, put them in the DLC dorm, which saved the taxpayers over a million dollars in that area. I changed the way we handled uh, in-state and out-of-state tickets. We were not doing it correctly. We were losing the opportunity to gain or to acquire about a million dollars a year. Uh, I've changed all of that. We are now able to obtain most of that and eventually probably 90% of that. Uh, you know that if you get a ticket and you don't pay it, you get something in the mail, and then when you go and try to get your license renewed, what happens? You got to go pay the ticket. So that was money there for the taking, and that's what we have done. We have also had a number, a number of uh, studies done trying to do what Tom we... Tom Stewart. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'll take this uh, time to remind everyone how this is going to work. So you guys have to turn in questions, and then we're going to ask the candidates. I think we've got two so far. So if you guys want to hear from your candidates tonight, now is your opportunity to turn in your questions for our sheriff's candidates. For our sheriffs, um, I think it would be okay if we pull that mic up a little bit, and I'll help you all get situated whenever you get there. It needs to be really close to your mouth, and we need to sleep, speak very slow and clearly so that the audience here and our audience at home can hear you clearly. So um, with that, we will take our first question of the evening. This question is from Miss Julie Kane, and she would like to know, what is your policy on support of the Happy Tales program at the detention center? And we'll start from the opposite end and, and go the other way. So Mr. Stewart, if you could um, start that question. Every candidate will have three minutes to answer if they need it. Uh, the Happy Tales program uh, is something that I know is, is really dear to a lot of people. We have a lot of people that do go out of their way in trying to help these animals uh, and try to find homes for the animals. Uh, it's something that is totally funded by the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have inmates that work out there, and they, they really do a really, really good job. You know, sometimes we have what we call, we have a statute that says it's a dangerous dog statute, and where you have dangerous dogs and you have vicious dogs. And these dogs have to be dealt with. And what happens when this occurs, let's say out in a parish, we have a problem with a dog. It bites a person or bites a dog. That dog is seized. It's put out into this uh, area at the detention center. Uh, sometimes these dogs are able to be rehabilitated and, and go into another environment. And sometimes the court actually has to get involved and actually has to, uh, to, to actually have to, you know, uh, put these dogs down because some dogs no matter what you try they are always dangerous and they're always vicious but we look every day to try to find homes for these animals and uh, I think we have dogs cat I don't think we have cats but we've had horses that are undernourished and things of that nature and so it's a, it's a really good program and I've had several Juanita Murphy uh, of course jumps out at me right now and she says whatever you do you better keep that and I see Shannon back there smiling. Uh, that program will be kept because I think that program is real helpful to the community and it saves a lot of animals and it finds new homes for a lot of animals. Thank you. Steve, you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna go in um, alpha. We're gonna go from one end to the next. So as soon as they get wrapped up, y'all be ready to move, okay? Thank you. Okay, got it. I, I totally support that uh, program. Uh, there's a lot of animals out there that are being uh, either uh, purposely not taken care of or, or people just can't afford to uh, take care of them. And, you know, every household just about in this parish, and these guys can tell you, have dogs. And some of them are not, ha not nice dogs. <laughs> but, um, and there's, there's a lot of animals out there that need taken care of, you know, and if we can do a program, we can have a program that we can help uh, take care of these dogs that are neglected or abused or whatever, then I fully support that. And it doesn't have to be dogs. It can be um, horses. There's a lot of horses I've seen over the years that people have tied out in a little lot that 
that are really in bad shape. And anything like that we can do because these animals can't fend for themselves. And uh, the, the, uh, the ones that we can take care of and the ones we can help, I fully support that. And uh, take a, look, a close look at that as a sheriff and, and see what we can do even make things better out there. Uh, I think it's a great idea having the inmates work with these animals. Uh, they, uh, they need something to do out there, and, and that will give them a, uh, something good to spend their time doing. And uh, I, I just, I, like I said, I fully support that program. I'd like to do more to support that program. And uh, when I get to be sheriff, I'll have to look into it because obviously uh, I don't know all the inner workings of it right now because I'm on the outside. But when I get on the inside, we'll, we'll address that. Thank you. And yes, I am in full support of Happy Tales by the number of times I got dunked for them at the dunking booth. Um, and I've talked to some people that participate in Happy Tales. The only concern that bothers me with it is where it's actually located within a facility. And that's through nobody's fault other than that was the location it had. But due to the, the citizens, non-law enforcement, non-detention center having to go there to participate in the program, they have to go all the way through the facility. Uh, some people have voiced some concerns about that. So I'd look at that, if I'm humbled enough to win the sheriff's race, look at that to see if it's a possibility of moving it or relocating it somewhere on the detention center grounds that the public does not have to go all the way through the detention center in order to participate in the program. But I am in full support of it. Can our SGA volunteers raise your hand again? These guys have slips. They have lines where you can write your questions. We are on to our second question now. Um, can each of you explain your business experience, handling budgets, managing employees, and being a spokesperson? So, uh, Mr. Pizant, we're going to start with you and come this direction this time. Yeah. Um, explain your business experience handling budgets, managing employees, and being a spokesperson. The budget, handling the budget, um, I was fortunate enough to be elected to LSTA president at Troop E for several occasions. I, I served as president, I was on a statewide board. At that time we had a, over a million dollar budget that we had to facilitate and make sure it worked and time we was actually able to invest money that we save to spend for later use. So the budget, it, even though it's $17 million, believes what it is, it wouldn't be, it's not that, I'm not scared to tackle it. Would, I love the opportunity to look at something new. Uh, the personnel have no problem with managing people. I've never been a supervisor myself other than I was a field training officer for 23 of the 26 years I was a trooper, so I did determine if somebody stayed employed or got fired with the state police as a training officer, I would have, like I say, no problem dealing with the, uh, personnel issues and what was the third? Being a spokesperson. Spokesperson. Um, and, well, I'm up in front of y'all now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it, and it, would, it would get easier to be in front and be the spokesman, but would not bother me at all. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh huh. That's a good question. Uh, as far as the budget goes, I, I spoke on it just a little while ago. The uh, when I was in the gaming station with the state police, I was over three different casinos, and uh, uh, we had uh, money coming in every month from those casinos, somewhere between forty and sixty million dollars a month. And it was up to us to make sure that the state of Louisiana got their 21%. And they wanted to make sure they got every penny of it. So we had to go through that. I had to supervise auditors to do that. As far as working within a budget as a supervisor, I've had to do that for several years. You know, you've got a certain amount of money over time that you can allow, and et cetera. And I've done that uh, several years as a supervisor. Uh, as far as superv the supervision, I've supervised troopers uh, for 12 years as a sergeant with the state police, made life or death situations, uh, sent them through a door or went through a door with them, had to decide whether to do that. 
So uh, supervision, I've, I've handled uh, problem employees, I've handled, uh, uh, I've given the attaboys, I've done everything that a, a supervisor has to do, you know, as far as uh, 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 discipline, uh, as far as uh, just talking to them when it's time to talk to them about certain situations. It's not always a time to drop a hammer on an employee whenever they do something that's not exactly right. But sometimes you have to do that. You have to decide, you have to learn that you're their supervisor and not their buddy when you become a supervisor. And that's not something that happens overnight. It's a learned experience. So, um, yes, I'm very comfortable supervising employees. I've done it for quite a while. As far as, uh, what was the next one? Being a spokesperson. Being a spokesperson, I'm good with that. I'm part of a, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've spoke in front of like 10,000 people on more than one occasion. Speaking in public doesn't bother me at all. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mr. Stewart? Thank you. Uh, I think I've already uh, described what I've done business-wise. I don't want to go over that again, but uh, I have been in business. I know what it's like to make a payroll. I know what it's like to handle individuals, pay your bills, and pay your bills on time. A pet peeve of mine is pay them your bills on time. Uh, I've always been a spokesman, I think, for, for law and order. In trying all the different jury cases that I've tried through the years, uh, I think I'm up there. I think I am doing what I need to do to make sure justice is served. I can say that I don't think I ever prosecuted someone that I didn't think was guilty. If I didn't think they were guilty, I don't think I would have ever prosecuted them. I don't think I could have got up in front of a jury with a straight face and said, this person's guilty. Uh, disregard the evidence. This person's guilty. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I did pretty good there. And you got the business and the, the employees. Uh, I was first assistant for 28 years. Uh, when Van or when Mike Henry was out of the office, it was all on me. I had to make decisions uh, immediately. Uh, I think that I've done a pretty good job in, in handling our employees, especially our patrol guys. These guys are out and they're on the street every night. They get into situations where uh, they need an immediate answer. I'm on call 24 7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If I see a deputy calls, I immediately get on the phone and I instruct him, all right, here's your problem, all right, here's what I think you ought to do. And it gives them a sense of relief that they have me to rely on to try to make sure that we get it right the first time. The worst thing in the world is to try to explain a mistake two years later when you get ready to go to trial. I think since I've been with the sheriff's office, I've been able to troubleshoot many, many situations where we got it right on the scene so we didn't have to worry about it on down the road. Um, thank you. I actually was thinking about throwing you guys a curveball and letting Steve Rashiel go first next time. We can't let uh, you guys on the end have all the fun. So uh, Steve Rashiel, if you could go ahead and make your way up there. We've got our next question, okay? This is from James Webb, and he asks, what if any plans do you have to utilize the reserve deputy program? Great question, Mr. Webb. Uh, when I started my police career, I started as a re uh, civil defense deputy back then. It's the same, basically the same thing as a reserve unit now. And uh, we, we did a lot of things. We rode with full-time deputies. That way uh, it, it was a, help, helped the full-time deputies quite a bit with safety on We'd go out like ride on the weekends with them at night. Uh, so I would like to use them for that. I'd like to use them for uh, uh, ha uh, catastrophes such as floods, uh, storms. Uh, use them as much as I can for that. Free up the uh, regular deputies to uh, go out and check on people. Use the full time. Use the reserve deputies to work intersections and roadblocks, and et cetera. I want to use them. Uh, in every way we can, get them more trained, get them as trained as I can get them because there may be times uh, that we may have to basically put them in a full-time role if things are busy enough. And so absolutely, that they're, they're there for a reason and I want to get them as trained as they can be because uh, they will take on the same role as a full-time deputy at times and they do have the same uh, uh, commission as a full-time deputy. So I'd like to use them in any way we can. Thank you. Steve Pizant, we'll go to you. The reserve program is a great program, and I actually see some of the reserves here and some of the people that are now full-time law enforcement started out in the reserve program. 
I've worked hand in hand with them since reserves have been out there answering calls, know how important it is to have a reserve program. And like Steve said, to get them trained, to get them because they are full, a fully commissioned officer. So the reserve program is very, very important. We need to use them and utilize them to what we can do for this parish. Um, because again, I've been, I've gone in houses with them when the reserve has answered the call, I've been their backup. So I know what, how important it is to have the reserve program because there was not enough deputies working or we had special events going on, so reserve filled in. It's very important and I am pledged to make it a very good division of the next pair of sheriff's office. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Stewart. What's interesting about our reserve officers is that they may be working next to you in an eight hour job. They may be uh, working at nights at a hospital, at a factory, at a plant. Uh, these folks have all different kinds of jobs and they fit into the community and then you look up one day and you see Paula Ray that's out there with a uniform on that's either directing traffic or at a ball game or at a funeral or whatever, wherever the need arises. We always are having situations where we are short of our full-time deputies, and so it's always good to have the reserve deputies there. They are well-trained. Uh, we encourage and we actually use that as a resource to try to get deputies to come on full-time and make it a full-time occupation. Uh, sometimes the pay is not where it, where it actually has to be, but these are people, they're citizens that want to contribute to the community, and so they are probably working way below their pay scale just to become a reserve deputy in helping and serving the community. Okay, St Steve Pizant, we're going to start with you for this one, okay? Do you plan to use resources available at NSU, and what ideas do you have for collaboration to improve our community? Yes, ma'am, I believe in using any resources available. It doesn't matter where they come from. Uh, and Northwestern is a huge asset here because all the, either the people that's employed here, the students that are here, as in the SGA putting us on tonight. Uh, yes, ma'am, we will use them. And anywhere, um, any programs we can get to help the next parish sheriff's office, the citizens of this parish, I will be 100% behind getting and using and making sure that this parish gets the, everything they need from anybody we can get it from. It's not just Northwestern, but any of the plants or anywhere we can get that we can get help, money, funding from to help this parish. I'm in for it. Thank you. Steve. Thank you, Steve. I'm so glad we have Northwestern in our, in our parish. Uh, I, I was just telling somebody yesterday, can you imagine what this town would be if Northwestern wasn't here? And so we need to take care of this campus. We need to take care of, the, uh, uh, of Northwestern with everything we have. Absolutely, we want to use uh, Northwestern's resources. We want to, like Steve said, we want to use resources wherever we can get them. Whatever we need to do to make this parish a better and safer place, well, whatever we need to, to do to, to, in, to lower this crime rate in this parish, whatever we need to do to invite industry into this parish and create jobs, we need to address all of that. And um, Northwestern is, and, and the Sheriff's Office is going to be a very good partner, have a good, very good partnership. Uh, uh, and, and another thing is I want to, um, I just want to maybe use a, start an internship program up there, you know, at the Sheriff's Office. Let some interns come in and work in the office and maybe they'll uh, uh, want to uh, pursue a career in law enforcement one day or maybe something like that. So uh, absolutely lock arms with them, build a strong relationship as we need to do with other agencies and other businesses in this, in this parish, and I'm all for that. Thank you, Steve Stewart. Uh, we're always willing to share whatever we can get revenue-wise. It's always hard to, to, to try to get money. But uh, most people don't realize, but we work real, real good with the campus security here. Uh, they have situations where they need our assistance, and then a lot of times we have situations where we need their assistance. And so we don't mind calling on them, and they don't mind calling on us to give us whatever help that we have. Uh, do you know that after every football game, you see a bunch of, every, there's a bunch of folks waiting outside 
uh, to go and clean up. Most of those are our work release trustees that are from the DC. We actually go in the Sheriff's Department and we clean up the stadium and, and most high school and college ball games. So we've got a great working uh, relationship and uh, with uh, President Chris Maggio, you know we all, everybody knows him and, and everybody gets along great. But uh, any type of source of, uh, of revenue is helpful. I spoke the other day at a student governing and I asked uh, how many in there were, uh, were actually registered voters, of course, and um, you know, five or six raised their hand. And then I asked how many were interested in, in criminal justice, and about six or seven raised their hand in criminal justice. So not only can we get a revenue source from them, but we would like to get some good employees and some good deputies from them. They're smart, they're educated, they're willing, and, and they're able, and we're ready to take them anytime. Mr. Stewart, I'll ask you this one as well. Okay, the next question is from Sheridan Douglas. What is your plan on lowering the crime rate? <laughs> lowering crime rate. Right? Well, <clears throat> there's, there's been a lot kind of misinformation recently about statistics and everything, and, and I'm not trying to push this off or kick the can, but you know, from the sheriff's standpoint, you, you have to kind of look at what we do. We really enforce the law outside of the city of Natchitoches. You know, we have Natchitoches uh, Police Department, and when you factor those statistics in and you include us in those statistics, it makes the whole parish look like, well, you know, the crime must be real high, but in reality, in the area that we actually deal with, we have concurrent jurisdiction with the city PD, but we let them handle almost all of the cases that occur in, in the city, and we handle the surrounding areas. And when you look at our statistics, it's really not that bad. We do a pretty good job in doing that. Reducing crime, cameras, camera thefts, that's one of our biggest complaints. Everybody needs to have a good camera system. Our guys know what these guys wear, how they walk, what kind of shoes they got on. You know, crooks really don't have but two or three, you know, uh, uniforms that they wear every day. So help like that. And the biggest thing is we have a problem in a lot of crimes, serious crimes, in getting people to, to help us out. We can get information from them, but there is an air out there now. There, there is a sense of retaliation that these young guys are putting out in our community that makes these guys, makes the witnesses, the victims, scared to come forward and, and, and help us. Uh, we can get all the information that, that we want, but we have to have their testimony. We have to have their witnesses. This is something I have done for 20, 28 years. Why well, put people in witness protection plans, the whole nine yards. And right now, these young guys are really threatening anybody that is willing to rat on somebody else. And this is real. This is not a joke. This hasn't been around for a long time, but it's about five or six years. They have really, really been causing us trouble. So we have got to convince people that you've got to come forward. You've got to help us. We will put these guys away, and we'll do the best thing that you can, we can do to make sure that your family is safe. Steve Rashell, we'll go to you next. Mm -hmm. Steve Rashel, sorry. <laughs> well, the first thing we need to do on this crime rate is, in, is uh, put more deputies out there. Right now, with over 220 employees at the sheriff's office, some nights we have two or three deputies working this whole parish. Not good enough. Uh, whenever uh, you have two deputies or three deputies working this whole parish, it's very seldom that you're going to see one pass your house, and it's not their fault. The deputies are doing all they can do. They're just understaffed. Uh, it's, it's, it, it needs some uh, leadership in there to make sure we have enough deputies working in this parish. We need to put back true resident deputies, and what I mean by that is when I was a deputy there, we worked the area where we lived. We rode those streets and those roads every day, the same ones over and over again. I could ride down any road in my zone, and I could tell you who lived in every house, and everybody in those houses, if I pulled into their driveway, could call me by my first name because that's just the way it worked. If something got stolen, I kind of knew where to start looking because I knew what, kind of, what criminal was good for that kind of crime most of the time. We'd go rule them out, or we'd recover the item right away. Uh, that has got to be done. We need to reestablish substations out in the uh, far outlying areas. Our substations that we had, and I would know how important they are. I worked the one. I worked the one out of Roebling for four years. Whenever you have uh, people that live out in those far outlying areas that have to drive all the way to Natchitoches, 
when they need a deputy or they don't when they need to visit with a deputy uh, and when we have a place right there they can stop to me it just doesn't make any sense so I want to reestablish those substations uh, we need to build trust in all of our communities right now people just do not trust I'm not just talking about the sheriff's office I'm talking about law enforcement in general and I think everybody will agree with that we've got to get out there and build relationships in all areas of this parish and uh, right now we're running for Nagatish Parish Sheriff, so I'm talking about Nagatish Parish. If we build that trust, people will talk to us. If they don't trust us, I don't care what you do, they're not going to tell you anything. So building that trust is imperative. Putting some more deputies out there to cover these areas is imperative. We've had a rash of thefts in the parish. We've had uh, uh, lawnmowers, uh, not lawnmowers, we've had four-wheelers stolen recently. We've had tractors stolen recently. And guess what? They probably wouldn't worry too much about seeing a deputy because they only had a very few working in this parish. But if there's a deputy in that zone riding around, chances are riding across somebody. It takes a while to load a tractor on a trailer at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm just going to tell you. And if somebody rides by and sees, a deputy rides by and sees that, guess what? We just took, that, took care of that problem. But if, it, if, the, if the deputies that are working are so scattered out that uh, chances of them getting by something like that are very slim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pizant. And yes, more deputies would have to need to be on the road. I tell everybody, when I come on in 1993 as a trooper, we had five deputies working, a south unit, a west unit, a rover, and two north units. When I retired on March the 12th, I worked the weekend March 8th, 9th, and 10th of this year, we had five deputies working 26 years later. Nagas Parish has grown, population, house-wise. Well, we have to have more deputies, be more visible, to help reduce the crime. So that, and, and I want them to know, I want deputies to go out, and if they see you in your yard and you backing up to a trailer, stop and visit. Make sure that you belong there. Make sure that that's the person belonging to get that trailer. You know, make conversation. That way we can help solve some of the crime simply by just being friendly, being want to interact with people and be seen, be out in the parish, be on the parish roads, be seen to help reduce the crime rate. Thank you. Stay close. The next question we have is from Alan Stanfield. If elected, will you be in favor of and work toward better patrols on Cane River? Yes, ma'am. And now that's a good question. You have to be, um, and of course you gotta work with wildlife and fisheries because they are the primary agency, but I know the, parish, the next parish sheriff's office does have a patrol unit that's, that's out there, but is it something that maybe if the budget allows, we can have someone out there full time during the peak season? because I've talked to people that live on Cane River and that's one of the complaints. They never see anybody except on special holidays. And with that, the speeds, the boats, the jet skis, everybody, nobody but obeys the laws posted for Cane River. So yes, I would be very much in favor of looking at if budget wise or grants, if there's grants out there, then to work with wildlife and fisheries to ensure that we are patrol because we have had numerous of accidents on Cane River that may have, may have been able to be avoided by us having people out there and even more people out there on the holiday season. Thank you. Steve Rasher. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alan, good question. We do have a Cane River Patrol, but I think their wings are being clipped as far as the enforcement side of things goes. Uh, I would like to uh, 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 increase the Cane River Patrols or have them more out there, basically for a safety issue. I'm not looking for somebody to get out there and write a bunch of tickets. I'm looking for somebody out there to get out there and, and try to keep things safe. Uh, we have uh, uh, debris that floats out every now and then. You know, we need to have them out there looking for stuff like that. Make sure people are not uh, trespassing, stealing stuff out of people's backyards that live up down that river. There's a lot of nice boats uh, docked up down that river. People sometimes that live there leave their tackle and their, those fa fancy, high expensive rod and reels laying in those boats. You know, and if there's nobody out there watching it, they just pull up there and just 
have themselves a nice, uh, put themselves in the fishing business is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, we'd like to, I'd like to uh, put the Cambridge Patrol, give them some more, put a little, uh, give them a little more power, a little more authority, but I don't want somebody out there writing tickets just all day long. I'd like to you know, use some good common sense, keep the river safe, uh, be out there, make it a safety issue, and uh, that's what we're all about is making negative safe for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Stewart? Uh, we do have a uh, uh, Cane River Patrol. We, uh, we do patrol and we uh, work all kind of special events such as anytime there's fireworks, we have to make sure everything is everybody's back and things of that nature. But you got to be real careful in who you put in a, uh, in a patrol. You got to make sure if you have a deputy, he's not a fisherman because I can tell you as soon as everybody moves out, he's going to get that rod and reel out and he's going to start fishing and if he catches a big 10-pound bass and then everybody's going to complain about that. But uh, it, it is something that, uh, that we have in the past. We have worked with the uh, Cane River uh, uh, folks down there with the association, and uh, they will actually reimburse us some of the money. But uh, mostly during the, the week, we don't have a whole lot of trouble. The weekends are where we're having uh, the most trouble now. And it's because these boats that they now are developing have these, they make these waves that are about four foot tall and they go over all of the, the retaining walls and it washes behind it. And people call in all the time about complaints about that. But anytime we have any increased activity, we are there, we are available, and we don't mind assisting. And uh, most of the guys do a real good job. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, I'll ask you this one as well. Our next question is from Doug Ireland. Who are leaders not limited to law enforcement who you admire and why? And conversely, name a leader you do not and why. He's looking for leaders that you admire and why, and uh, conversely, a leader that you do not and why. Not limited to law enforcement. Hmm. That, that, can, that can be hard to answer. The, uh, the leader that I most admired, I guess, growing up was my dad because I think that's where I've got a lot of my leadership ability uh, in making sure that, you know, if you say something, you know, tell the truth, stick behind what you have to say. Uh, in this political arena, I wouldn't dare uh, name <laughs> any political person as a, because I really don't think really uh, I have a, a favorite in that, I, I could honestly say. But, uh, no, but you know, always growing up, and even this day and time, when I see uh, several of the, like uh, my old high school coaches, I still call them coach. I always thought coaches were really, really uh, just an inspiration to me. Uh, they were like your second dad. And so that, there's a lot of them that's been, in, I, I've had a lot of coaches that I have looked up to and people like that. Um, I've also looked up to Victor Jones. Uh, he, I've been working for him for seven years, and I've seen how he does things. And I'm telling you, he's one of the best people person that you will ever find anywhere. He will go out of his way to do anything. It doesn't matter. He had me, this is no joke, I show up one day, and I don't have a coat and tie, but I had some nice clothes on. It was during the flood. He says, come on, you got to go with me. So I hop in his vehicle, his truck, and we go down where the water is already over the roads. There's a tractor waiting on us. So me and him and one other person, we get into this tractor, and it's like that, uh, that, that picture you see with everybody in the phone booth, and we were all pretty big. We go down this road. We go down so far we can't go any further. A boat comes and gets us, and we get in that boat, and we go down to a grave site where the flood has caused these caskets to rise to push up through the concrete deal. And we had to sit there with a coffee can and dip water out and put caskets back into where they belong. And uh, it just takes a real special person to do that kind of work. Thank you, Stuart. Mr. Rashel? Thanks, Doug, for that question. <laughs> My answer is Jack Britton. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'd have to say, well, here's my mother sitting right here. I don't want to offend her, but I, my daddy brought me to the hayfield from the time I was a little boy and taught me a work ethic. And that's all, I mean, I worked hard all my life, and, uh, and, I'm, and that's why I work hard now, I guess, because he told me that you have to work for everything you get. Nothing comes free, son. And I just got out, and that's the way I was raised. And I believe in giving a man a hard day's work for our, for our, our day's pay. And uh, a lot of people know my daddy. 
and uh, I'll just tell you what, uh, he's, he's been really strong in my, in my life as far as teaching me that work ethic. Is my time up? No. And, um, and that's, that's, I think that's the best gift somebody can give somebody is teaching them how to work and provide for their self and for their family. Um, I guess uh, somebody that had a big role in my life was uh, back when I was in high school, I had a teacher named Charles Stevens, and he was our agriculture teacher, FFA te uh, leader. And that man spent a lot of time with us boys in school. He taught us how to weld, he taught us how to do this, and he took us camping and, and everything. And uh, he just took time with us, and I'm gonna tell you, uh, if, if there were more people like that man right there, then uh, I think this world would be a lot better place. But I'm not taking away, anything away from my mama. She was right there encouraging us to get out there and get it too. So. Yeah, I'd have to say my daddy for my work ethic and Charles Stevens for showing us how to uh, spend time with our kids and, and teach us things that we need to know to grow up and be uh, good members of society. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Mr. Pizan? And I'm going to echo what they said about my daddy. But also I'm going to throw my two grandpas in there. Oh, they were very instrumental in me turning out to who I am. One of them was a dairy farmer his whole life. The other one was a boiler maker. So I understood how to work every day when I was with them. And the work ethic was get up, go to work, do your job, do it correctly, come home, get ready to go do the same thing the next morning. And that's huge even today. Um, as a trooper, I had the same mentality, get up, go to work, do your job, do it correctly, come home, go to sleep, get up, do it again the next day. So, Doug, with the, my two grandpas and my daddy, that was a very, thank you for that. Um, and you know, the least liked, I don't know that I don't like anybody. I may not agree with some of the things they do or say, but I don't know that I dislike them because of it, because the good thing about where we live, everybody has their, can have their own opinion. That's the good thing about the country we live in. So, I'm not, don't dislike anybody. Thank you. Shifting gears a little bit. Regarding the recent events in the national news, how would you prepare the Natchitoches Parish Sheriff's Office to respond to an active shooter situation in Natchitoches Parish? We'll start with you, Steve. Well, first of all, training. Uh, and training's huge in that, but and having the school resources officer trained up and schooled and know what to do, along with the educators in there, all the principals and everybody, because, you know, you think it's not going to happen, but it's getting closer and closer. Pray, pray that it does not happen here. But we have to be trained. Everybody has to be on the same page, and whether it's, State police, sheriff's office, city police, Northwestern, the, town, the village marshals, it don't matter. Everyone needs to be trained because just about every one of our schools out in outlying parishes are within a village that also has a, a marshal. So I think we all need to train together, get on the same page, and know that when we, when we get there, I know as a deputy, what that marshal's going to do, what that city police officer's going to do, because you, you can't wait for somebody to get there to help you. You can't wait and say, oh, let me wait on another deputy, let me wait on a trooper, let me wait on somebody to get there. The first people there has to go. So everybody needs to be trained. Training is going to be huge. Get funding for the training. Get funding, and let's see if there's things we can do to secure our schools so that maybe we, they can't get into our schools. Um, and, and Stuart talking about cameras with thieving. Well, I'm the same way about active shooters with cameras. Why don't we have cameras available at our schools to see who is pulling in the driveways? When are they pulling in? Are there things we can see? Because with technology and training, I don't know that you can stop it, but maybe you can slow it down, the response to where the school resource officers can have a chance to engage them before they do get inside the building. Thank you. I 
I think there's been 22 active shooting, mass shootings in the United States so far this year. Um, I know I, I'm, I have been trained an active shooter in schools as a SWAT guy. We, as soon as I think it was Columbine was over with, the next training we had, we started training on that. And you have to train, you have to just uh, find a, we just found a vacant school and we went in and in. We had put bad guys in there, acting bad guys, in and in and in. And we got to where it came second nature to us going in. We need to do that with our, with our patrol deputies especially. Uh, train them over and over and over again. So we don't have a situation like they had in Florida where they pull up there. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's hard to run toward gunfire. I've done it. Whenever you pull up and you hear gunfire, it's hard to run. I don't think that guy, I, well, I know that guy should have done his job and didn't do it. But when you're trained and you're really proficient at what you do, then it's a lot easier to, to run toward that gunfire because you're not running blindly. So we have to do uh, uh, a lot of training. Uh, it's, it's, it's imperative. Um, you know, I walked into a school, and I'm not going to say which one, just a, about a couple of weeks ago here in Natchitoches Parish. My wife and I, we walked in the front door of that school, walked right through the school to the other side of the school to a deal was having. Nobody was there to check me. Anybody could have done just exactly what I'd done. If they'd had bad intentions, it, would have, it could have been terrible. So if we, uh, we protect everything else, but we don't protect our kids like we need to protect our kids. We have school resource officers in these schools, and, and they do a good job, but they can only do so much. You know, we have got to do better as far as security at those front doors of the schoolhouse. So anybody like myself, if I was going to be a, had ill intentions, can't just walk in there and start creating havoc in a schoolhouse. And I firmly believe that. And if I'm elected sheriff, we will have that. Thank you. The uh, active shooter training probably is a uh, number one priority of ours, and I kind of feel I'd have to admit a little inadequate in describing how much detail we go into when you have Jesse Titano, who is in charge of that, sitting in the audience. But working with him, uh, I can tell you that we do uh, uh, just a tremendous amount of training, not only in the school atmosphere, but also the hospital, businesses around town. Everybody now is aware of what's going on in, in, this, uh, in this country and all of the crazy things that we, we have, and we've got to get it right the first time. I tell our resource officers all the time, and sometimes they think that they're just babysitters, that they're just there to babysit at the school, and I tell them, no. I said, I worry more about what goes on and what you're doing there than I do probably with the average patrol guy on the side of the road. What goes bad on the side of the road is going to affect maybe one or two or three people, somewhere like that. If we make a mistake in these schools and we don't see something that we ought to see, we can have a catastrophe. They change the laws on all of the, the schools as far as what we have to do if a situation arises because every different situation has to be evaluated. And at any time we have a credible threat that there may be harm to the school, the personnel, we have to take immediate action. Uh, and this is not really discretionary. If we really believe there's a credible threat, we have to take that sometimes nine, ten-year-old kid, take him into custody and get him to a hospital, have him evaluated. He can't even come back to school until he sees a physician and is evaluated. But I tell our resource officers all the time, you know, whatever is happening, you know, call me. Let's talk about it. And that is our biggest, biggest, I guess, liability is that if we make a mistake there, it could really be catastrophic. We have kids bringing, we had a kid the other day that brought a bullet, just a bullet to school. Now, in, in reality, he was just showing people. He wasn't, it wasn't a dangerous instrumentality. It was just a bullet, but, you know, the school policy is you can't bring that. But they have to identify this. Not only are they friends with these kids, but because they are friends and they get information, other kids tell these guys, our resource officers, hey, so-and-so's got a knife, so-and-so's got a gun. It's just real, real important that these resource officers communicate with these kids because I'm telling you, there's nobody else in their place. It's, they have to recognize it, and we, if we get it wrong, we've got a major problem on our hand. But we train, we train, we train. We're on campus training in active shooter. It makes all the uh, NSU students a little nervous when they walk by and they see SWAT running in with rifles and all of that, but uh, it's, it's just part of it. That's what we are facing this day and time. And uh, Jesse's done a great job in, in training not only the resource officers, but all of uh, many, many civilians in town.
I'm going to start with Steve Rashel for the next one. It's, it's your turn to go first. It's been a little bit. Uh, this next question is from Haley Titano. It's easy for some employees to come to work every day for their normal eight to five, do just enough to earn their paycheck and go home until they can earn retirement. How will you motivate your employees to go the extra mile, work harder, and strive for new and improved law enforcement techniques, trainings, and supervision? Tra good question. Trainings will be mandatory. We don't. We won't have to ask them to put in for training. But they'll be they'll training will be mandatory for the position that they have. Obviously, if you have a patrol guy, you're not going to send him to uh, a school that don't pertain to what he's going to do. That's a. I don't believe in wasting money. Uh, I've been to a lot of training over my career, and about 10 percent over to 20 percent of it's been actually related to what I do. So I want to make sure that the training that they receive is uh, relates to what they do. But I also want to make sure that uh, they know it's mandatory to be to have the training. Um, if they have training out there available and, the, and they bring it to me or to uh, whoever I have in charge of that, and it pertains to what they do and we can afford it, we'll absolutely send them to that. We want to make sure that all everybody is trained to the best of their ability. As far as uh, uh, an employee that just barely gets by, well, we'll probably have. Uh, uh, some serious talks with that employee. See, when I was a trooper, we had a yearly evaluation, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. Uh, and if you rate certain uh, a certain way, you get your pay raise next year. If you don't, uh, if you don't live up to what you're supposed to be doing, you don't get your pay raise. If you're not doing your job, you're not going to work for me. If you do your job, you will be fine. I want every, I want all all the deputies to understand that. Uh, I'm not going in there, and this is a little off subject, but I'm not going to go in there and clean the house. But if you're doing your job, you're fine. And so uh, absolutely, if uh, if you have an employee that's substandard, we need to get him up to standard or him or her up to standard, whatever way we have to do that. If they're doing a great job, we want to reward them for that and then give them their pay raise when it's due. But uh, And the training is going to be mandatory training, and uh, we will keep our employees very well trained. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wright, we'll go to you next, please. Mr. Stewart, we'll go to you next. I'm going to bring a little uh, cheat sheet on this as far as training is concerned. Uh, we're required, post re requires us to have certain, uh, so many hours of, uh, of training, and it's usually 20 hours. Uh, we require our guys to have at least 40 hours of training in a specific field. We not only have uh, the, the training uh, facilities here, but we also, we have certified uh, instructors that train in these divisions in firearms training, active shooter response, civilian response to active shooter events, defense tactics, de-escalation techniques for law enforcement, less lethal weapons, chemical weapons, fair and impartial policing, use of force mitigation, search and seizure, first aid, CPR, and AED. So we, we go above and beyond what is really required for us as far as our training. Uh, we want our guys trained, I can tell you, not only from a law enforcement standpoint, but also from a liability standpoint, lawsuits, that the more we train and the better we handle the situation, the less likely somebody's gonna get hurt and the less likely we're gonna get sued. And I know a little bit about both of those. So we do and we emphasize all the time, it's hard to teach a deputy common sense. And that's one thing when we are hiring people, we are looking really at, at the person and how that person, how is he gonna to relate to the, the people out there? Uh, is he gonna take things to the next level without really good, good calls? Or is he gonna be a person that can sit down and just say, hey, you know, let's sit down, let, let's talk about this. Maybe we can work this thing out. So selecting good deputies, training them the proper way and giving them as much training as possible has always been very, very important. Thank you, Stuart. Mr. Pizant. And as Stuart said, training is important. In my last few years as a trooper, we went to heaven we actually had four days of training. We had to go to Baton Rouge for four 12-hour days training that dealt with everything. Can you train too much? No. But with that being said, it's going to take more deputies because when you start having training longer, it's going to take more deputies. So the training is very important. The 
talking about the work morale, I'm going to expect them to work like I do. I come to work, I do my job, and I go home. And if everybody will do that, if it's a, somebody that's just doing what's necessary to get by, let's sit down and talk to with them and ask them why. Are they not enjoying their job? Are they having trouble at home? Are they having trouble with their kids? Their parents sick? Why is that person not having fun at work? Because if you don't have fun, and I don't mean that, I guess it, I should use the word enjoy work. If you don't enjoy coming to work, you're going to have a hard time working. I always said I didn't never think I had a job with the state police because I love doing it. And that's what you want everybody to get to, to understand that they, they want to want to come to work every day, want to be there from 8 to 4.30, or if they had to be there at quarter to late or stay till 5 o'clock, that's okay. You want to enjoy it. And is it because of lack of training that, and they, that they don't know what they need to be doing all day? Uh, don't know, but the morale would be, I would expect them to be like me and come to work and do their job. As if I'm home enough to be elected sheriff, I would do for the people of this parish, come to work and do my job as sheriff, and I would expect all employees to do their job. Thank you. Mr. Wright, we'll go to you for the next question. What, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge facing our next sheriff, and what is your plan to overcome that challenge? Uh, actually, the answer is pretty easy. Drugs. Drugs is our biggest problem. Drugs is what probably uh, is causing 90% of the criminal activity. And can I sit up here and tell you that I can solve that? In four years, no, I can't do it, but I can tell you that we can fight it as hard as we can. We, can. we can work with our drug court program that we have. We can try to get people help. Whenever there is a demand for something, there's going to be a supply. Uh, I have a pet peeve about uh, all of the people who are allowed to cross our border uh, with drugs. You know, those little knapsacks they have on their back, they don't have their drawers in their, uh, in their, in their socks in there. They've got pills in there. We used to go out and we could bust a meth lab out in the wood and woods and we would stop a little bit of the drug uh, activity around here. Now most of it's coming from Mexico. And what scares me the worst is that now they're mixing all of this stuff with fentanyl, fentanyl and some of these other dangerous, dangerous drugs. These kids in high school who want to experiment with this, uh, I just worry every day. I think we've had three or four deaths in the last, I'll just say a year or so, so you don't try to narrow it down, that I think are related to, to an overdose, and I think it was some kind of contaminated drug that, or, or, or substance that was in a pill that they didn't think was what it was. These, 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 uh, it's just really, really scary what we have with the drugs. But it's an endurance contest. We can't just say we give up. So we've got to fight it. We've got to encourage uh, these kids as early as possible. Do not experiment with these drugs. They will kill you. These drugs are dangerous this day and time. Back in my day, there were people that would experiment with marijuana. Well, it wasn't going to hurt you. Uh, but this day and time, they have what they call mojo. I don't know if you've heard about mojo. It's a synthetic marijuana. That stuff makes you go absolutely crazy. And I mean, they are, you know, we've had two or three of them that got on mojo and they're running down the street without any clothes on. It just makes you do crazy things. So that's what scares me more than anything is, is and I think that's something that we'll, we'll be fighting for a long time, is the drug problem. Uh, not only the illegal drugs, but the prescription drugs and the pill factories that they have around here. Uh, we have got to do something about it, and we have a task force. We uh, coordinated with the, uh, the feds here a while back, and we got a guy that was a drug dealer in town. Uh, we got him. He was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. So the bigger the case, a lot of times we can coordinate with the feds, get them involved, because there's no early release with the feds. Mr. Rachel. I agree with Stuart. Our biggest problem is the drug problem. Um, and, and we've got to get aggressive with the drug problem. Uh, we've got to, uh, got to put an end to it or slow it down as much as we can. I've uh, worked drug cases in my career. I've been an uh, investigator. I've been a supervisor in, in our narcotics investigations. And we need to take a strong, strong uh, approach to fighting these drugs. Probably about 80% of the rest of our crime 
is related directly to the drug problem. And if we can lower the drug problem, we're never going to stop it. Nobody's ever going to stop it. But if we can lower the drug problem, then by default, we'll lower other crime as well. Um, uh, several years ago, the people of this parish were promised a facility to help people that got on drugs, give them some help. We have a lot of people, and probably every family in this parish and in this state and probably in this country has some family member that's been affected by drugs uh, one way or the other. And uh, we've got to do something to help some of these people that get caught up in this mess. And uh, I, I, that facility was promised. It never happened. But if I'm elected for sheriff, it will happen because I've already started doing the, the leg work to make sure that we can do that and we can do that. As far as combat, combating the drugs, we've got to build relationships. I've said that before and I'm, I, st I stick to that with the people in this parish. We've got to have the help of the people in this parish. A deputy in a patrol car or, or, or a narcotics officer can do only so much, but we have got to build the trust of these people and we've got to have help from the public and uh, so we'll know everything that's going on. But we have, that the drugs are the biggest problem we have. Uh, and I agree with that 100%, Stuart. Thank you. Mr. Pizan? I have to agree with both of them, drugs. Uh, what else can I say other than what they said, that drugs is a problem? We have to combat it. By doing that, is it more deputies? Training the deputies better that's on patrol to know what to look for when they out with someone, whether it's a stranded vehicle or they assisting somebody or they make a traffic stop. It goes back to training, but it all goes back to drugs and, and what can we do as a parish as a whole to combat that? Let's, let's get some technology involved and, and maybe have some technology that allows people to text when they see something that needs to be reported that we get an immediate, it goes immediately to, when we, we can go to NATCOM, which is the communications, so they can get a hope to the deputies is working and let them know we just got a text about a drug deal here, this is a car, and let's go out there and see if we can find it to start combating the drug problem at the street level so that our kids, as young as 10 years old, do not get hooked on drugs and let's start fighting it as a parish and everyone getting involved in fighting the drug problem and not being afraid to text or call or email or whatever to us to say, I just witnessed this, this is the vehicle, y'all, if you round, stop it and let's see if we can't find the drugs because in order to get a hundred dollar bill, you got to start with a one and then you get to a five and a 10, 20, 50 and a hundred. So does it really matter which one you catch as long as you catch it? It doesn't. So let's go after all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pizant, we'll start with you for this one. What does servant leadership mean to you, and how do you plan on implementing it in our parish? I didn't hear it. Servant leadership. What does servant leadership mean to you, and how do you plan on implementing it in our parish? By coming to work every day and working for the people of this parish, and even the visitors come through here because what is Natchitoches? Natchitoches is a tourist town. So we all have to, we, we, we also have the influx of tourists every day. Come to work, do your job, look professional, treat everyone professional, and lead by example to be the servant of the people and it doesn't matter where they're from because <clears throat> excuse me, we actually have people from other countries come through this parish and stay here. So let's be, let's everyone be good service of the department. But even everybody in Natchitoches, let's all do this together to make this work. And, and if we don't work together, I'm not saying we're not going to gain ground, but it won't be like we can gain ground together and everybody help serve this parish to the best of their ability, which is what I will do if I'm home enough to be elected sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rachel, we'll go to you next. <clears throat> Servant leadership means remembering who you work for. You work for the people. You don't, they don't work for you. 
you've got to go out there every day and, and do you, what you can to help as many people as you can. And uh, as far as the leadership, uh, my deputies will see me doing that because I will not ask them to do anything that I won't do. And they're going to see me out there treating people fairly. We're going to treat people, uh, uh, everybody equal. We're going to treat people fairly, like I was saying. And we're going to never forget who we work for. Just like as a, as a sheriff, my door will be open because anytime your boss needs to see you, he needs to be able to tell you, see if you're in the office. And my boss is the people out there in the parish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I've always said that for the last 35 years, uh, we, I, have had to, you know, serve the people of Natchitoches. In the capacity as an assistant DA and also at the sheriff's office, what we do is we have to uh, work with the people or else what? We don't get, a, we don't get elected. Uh, it's different when you have to work day in and day out with the people of a parish or, or county or wherever you live in the United States. You know, you have to do what you're supposed to do or you get voted out. And I'll lead by an example, you know, by example, the things that I do, uh, the guys see me around there do, you know, they never expected me, you know, uh, I was the in-house attorney uh, kneeling over a grave with a coffee can, dipping water out so we could get a casket uh, out, uh, get, or get it back in. Uh, and what I'm saying is that uh, Victor Jones was a, was a prime example that everybody in that office, you, your job description is to do whatever it takes to help the public. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you can get that little written job description that's in your file and you can throw it out the window. If these people need help, you help them. If they need gas, you go get gas. If they need a battery jumped off, you jump it off. You serve the people and the people will respond by keeping you employed. We'll start with you for the next one, Mr. Wright. The next question is from James Stanfield. What are your thoughts on helping provide affordable security systems for households in the parish? Well, our, our budget is kind of tight like it is, but uh, I don't think we can put a security system in, in, with, in every house in the whole, uh, in the whole parish. Um, there are some, there are a lot, I've mentioned cameras there earlier. These cameras really are inexpensive, uh, and they are great. Uh, when I've been knocking on doors lately, you know, the funniest thing is that I bet you 99% of the time when I'm knocking on that door, the person inside that house has no idea who's on the other side of that door. And what do they do? They open the door, and there I am. Now, I'm not there to hurt anybody, obviously, obviously but if somebody was there to hurt somebody, then they would be in a world of trouble. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the rural area, the probably number one security system that they have in place right now are pit bulls because I've had to dance and dodge and everything else around these, these dogs. They, they come out, they got chains on them, and they're just long enough that they'll get about that close to you. So it's, in the rural area, it's, it's, real, it's real hard for us to patrol enough uh, space. We've got 900 miles of roads in this parish, and I'm telling you, sometimes it takes 15 or 20 minutes just to go from one end, uh, the, let's say the north end of the parish, to, from the east to west over there. So these crooks, these crooks kind of know where we are. And that's one thing that I'm not really in favor, or, favor of are or, or the substations because I would rather have that deputy out there on the street so that he is patrolling. And those crooks don't know where he's going to be, and he may take a right, but he may come back. But if he's sitting at a substation, I think it's going to create a lot more problems than, than what we have had in, in the past. Substations were great in 1980. Technology has made them obsolete, in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Pizant, we'll go to you next. I don't, well, I know the next pair of sheriff's office budget can't afford security systems, but are there grants out there to help people, the elderly, or single mothers get them? I don't know, but there's something we can look at. But why not have enough deputies to where you see a deputy come by your house more than once every three or four days? You keep hearing me go back to that more deputies on the road, and that's, that's going to be one of my things. You will see more deputies on the road because you deserve that as a citizen of this parish. We need to, and like Stuart said, every house you go to out in the country, when you knock on that door, a dog starts barking. I mean, if it ain't barking when you get there and knock on the door, 
it's going to start barking. I did not realize that probably 70% of this parish has, the city included, have a dog inside their house or on the outside chained up that is a pretty good deterrent. So is, are, there, are there funds out there available to help with that? Don't know, we'd have to look and see. Um, but I am in favor of doing what it takes to ensure the safety of everyone in this parish. Thank you. Come out to Happy Tales and get you one of those dogs we were talking about. Cheap security system. But uh, no, the, uh, the, uh, I'm going to increase patrol cars. That's about the best the sheriff's office can do is put more deputies out there protecting your house and your families. And uh, we're going to increase those patrols. I keep saying the resident deputies, uh, uh, they worked in 1986. They work today. Substations worked in 1986. They'll work today. See, those substations are for more than just uh, uh, a deputy getting out of his car. Those substations are built so people can come in and do their business with the sheriff's office. I worked at the one in the west part of this parish. And uh, you try telling those people that came in there on a daily basis and built those relationships with the sheriff's office, that they're not use, they weren't they weren't useful, and uh, I think uh, I tell you what you let me as your sheriff I'll show you how useful they are, so thank you. Mr. Rashel, we'll start with you for the next one. Mr. Rashel, we'll start with you for the next one. Just keeping you on your toes there. Um, with the decline in release of the Louisiana prison population due to criminal justice reform, sheriff's offices around the state are struggling financially to effectively operate their correctional facilities. What is your solution to this problem if you are elected sheriff? And I can repeat that question. I know it's lengthy. Y'all need me to. Well, that's a really good question. You know, and that, that is a problem. Uh, uh, trying to keep the people in the jailhouse, I guess, is the best way to say it, to, to afford to run the jailhouse. But, uh, you know, it's just a problem that you have to deal with. Uh, when people get released, uh, there's a lot of criminals out there. I think Mr. Wright uh, said something uh, the other day that had 500 felonies in the parish last year and they could only try 50 of them a year because of time restraints and all. Well, you know, uh, maybe we can uh, do something to increase those felony prosecutions and, and get more people in jail that need to be in jail. Uh, I know that when people get released, we have a higher incarceration rate in the state right now. I think we're one of the highest out there. And so uh, people get released, but there's still plenty of people to, to take their place in, in the jail. So um, we'll try to streamline the operations of the detention center and uh, cut costs where we can. But we have, to, uh, we have to have a detention center out here because we live in a place where uh, we have to have a place to put criminals when we pick them up. So it's just going to be a matter of uh, good business, being a good steward of the people's money, and trying to streamline the best we can and cut costs where we can but uh, we'll just have to, that's something we have to work with. Mr. Pizant, we'll go to you next. Thank you, Steve. You're going to have to read it. Okay. Oh, hang on. I'll put it up. Mm -mm, right here. With the decline and release of the Louisiana prison population due to criminal justice reform, sheriff's offices around the state are struggling financially to effectively operate their correctional facilities. What is your solution to this problem if you're elected sheriff? Well, first of all, we have to do what legislation abide by the laws that the legislation passed, which reduced the number of inmates that we had housed here. Um, and I'm, I guess, fortunate enough to know that right now that the sheriff's office is housing federal detainees out there to make up the money difference in order to ensure that y'all, that the Sheriff's Office Detention Center stays open. It's, it was a good steward of the money to do that. But at the same time, it now allows us to keep the detention center open so those that don't fit the Justice Reform Act, that we can put them in there and keep them. Because it's, I don't like the word, they, they say catch and release. I don't like that because we need to catch them and they need to serve sentences that are imposed on them and not have to not have to get set free because we don't have enough facilities open in this state. 
And as, like I said, the next pair of sheriff's office is doing now, the detention center is housing federal inmates, which is allowing it to stay open and have beds available for people that need to be incarcerated in this parish. Thank you. The detention center is a daily battle for us. Uh, we used to have around 400 to 485 DOC, that's Department of Correction Facility, or, or in, uh, inmates in our facility. Now, a DOC may come from New Orleans, Shreveport. They are sent here by the state, and we house them. Uh, you know what they pay us to, to house these guys? They pay us $25 a day, give or take a few cents. But yet a DOC facility like Angola or one of the other ones, it costs them $60 a day to house one of those guys. How can we expect, be expected to even break even when we're getting $25 a day and they're getting, you know, and it's costing $60 a day to house them? It's, it's, a, lose, it's a losing proposition. Two things that I did to try to uh, at least relieve some of that was I mentioned earlier about these guys that are on probation. You know, if you commit a crime and you're, it's your first offense, let's say, and you're, let's say it's a burglary, and you're sentenced to five years, suspended five years probation. All you have to do to stay out of jail is not get in any more trouble. So these guys are out on probation, and they get in trouble again. So we arrest them on a new charge. We put them out at the D.C., and we have two jails at the D.C. We have the D.O.C., and then we have the pretrial jail. The pretrial jail is where this, guy's go, this guy goes. Now, he's already been convicted of one felony, but then he commits another crime, and so we've got him out there. Who pays for that? You do, the taxpayer. It costs us $25 a day plus all of his health insurance to see that this guy is housed. So what I started doing was, this guy's on probation. He violated his probation. Let's get him up and let's get him revoked. And if the judge revokes him, then he is sentenced, he is, he is ordered to serve out his original sentence, which is, which is five years in the Department of Correction. So what I had to do is find a way to do it because there was such a volume. I actually went back to the DA's office while I was working at the sheriff's office, wasn't getting paid by the DA. I found a way to go back as an assistant DA to handle these revocations. So what I would do is go in within 30 days, this guy has committed a new crime. I would get him revoked. It's a mini trial, no juries, nothing like that. I would get him revoked in 10 minutes. He goes from costing us $25 a day over to the DOC where now he's housed and the state's paying us $25. It's not what we need, but at least it was going to eliminate and it would build up our DOC population. Well, then DOC started taking these guys and moving them to some other place. So I had to kind of figure out how to keep these guys here. I would refuse to dismiss the new charges on this guy. So therefore, the DOC didn't want to come pick this guy up and move him to New Orleans because he was going to have to go back and forth with all of these pretrial hearings on the new trial. So that was one way that that, that right there is a million dollar a year turnaround, just getting these guys out of that pretrial dorm over into the DOC dorm. It's one of those things where it didn't really take a whole lot of effort to do it, but in three years, I think I revoked like 176 of them. It's like three or four million dollars worth that it saved the parish. Now, the feds- That's time, that's, Stuart. Sorry. Oh, sorry. That's our three minutes. I didn't see a red deal. It, yeah, they're, oh, they're down here, the yellow. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, unless we have any other questions that come down from the audience, this will be the last one of the evening. And then everybody will have another three minutes to give final remarks. So with this one, we'll start with Mr. Pizant and work our way this way. And we'll uh, go in the same uh, direction for our final remarks, okay? So our last question of the evening, if elected on your first day on the job, what will be the first thing that you do? To get sworn in as sheriff. <laughs> Um, hey, and <clears throat> ensure that the employees know that I will be there for them to help them, assist them, as well as everyone in this parish to be very humbled by that, that I was elected in this parish and to let people know that I am there for them 24 hours a day, seven days a week because I, I as Steve said, do work for the people in the parish. To let everybody know that as your sheriff, I will be there, the deputies will be there, the employees will be there, everyone will be here for you for the next four years for sure. Thank you.
Well, like Steve said, we gotta, we'll, have, uh, we'll be meeting with everybody. We'll let them know where we stand, what they expect from them, get them on the right page, get them, on the right, uh, get, get, get them headed in the right direction, and let them know that we're going to have, a, uh, we're gonna have a, a, a department that looks out for each other. We're going to have a department that works together. We're going to have a department that uh, goes out and treats the public fairly. Goes out and, and I'm not saying the, the deputies are not doing some of that or all that now. I'm saying what we're going to do. We're going to have a department that uh, uh, <clears throat> treats everybody fairly, like I said, regardless of any of their circumstances. And so um, that's the main thing. We're going to let them know that, remind them that they work for the people, not for uh, me. Well, they work for me, but they, we, all, we all work for the public. And uh, we just look forward to making Natus a safer place for the people. We're going to let them know where our priorities are as far as keeping Natus safe. We're going to go from, uh, uh, we're going to re, uh, get more people on the road from day one. And uh, that's, that's absolutely what we have to do. Thank you. You know, the sheriff, the new sheriff won't take office until, what, July of next year, so there's a pretty good little window in there. Uh, as far as what I would do on the first day uh, if I was elected, uh, I plan to be there until that July 1st, and to me it's going to be a transition of maybe moving a desk from right here over to right here. Uh, as far as changing, these guys have, have they've worked with me for seven years. Uh, in the DA's office, I've worked with the, with the sheriff for, you know, 30 years. Uh, they know me, they know my personality, they know what, I, what I'll put up with and what I want. The, the good thing about it is, I, I was going back and I was thinking, I said, you know, after, in seven years I've had, a, I mean, just many, many, many situations that have uh, come about. And each time, they, uh, mostly they will ask me, you know, what do you think, what do you think? And I'll tell them what I think. And, uh, you know, I've not had one of the deputies really just say, ah, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Oh, you're crazy and all that. Because I think they know that they can talk to me. And we've had this ongoing kind of conversation for the last uh, seven years. They know I'm there for them. I know some of the patrol guys, they, they, uh, when they first start their report, they said I talked with Stuart because they know they're going, they, that's going to get them out of a bind if it goes south. It's going to be on me and not on them. Uh, but that's okay. You know, I think we've done a pretty good job. So as far as, uh, as, far as the first day, uh, you know, my philosophy has always been uh, serve the people. We love helping people. Even the DA's office, when I was there for 28 years, believe it or not, we help more people than we put in jail. Uh, believe me, these college parents called and, and they had their son that was in a little bind with this, that, and the other. And our motto was, we want them to get out of Northwestern with a degree and not a record. And so we work with all of these juveniles uh, so that they can have a, a successful life. One blemish on their record can create so much havoc in the, in the future that sometimes you, you got to just use common sense. And sometimes you got to say, Okay, I'm going to take a chance with this kid because I think he's going to work out good, and most of the time that it does. So first day on the job, it's going to be like the last seven uh, years on the job. We're here to serve the people. Okay, thank you all very much. Again, we're going to give you three minutes to make any closing remarks at this time. Mr. Pizant, we'll start with you. First of all, again, I want to say thank y'all for everybody that showed up to participate in this. Um, as I said from the get-go, my very first day when I announced I was running, I'm not running against anyone. I'm running for the office of sheriff. I'm not a politician. I'm a candidate for sheriff. My door will be open, but more importantly, I will come see you instead of you having to come to me. I want to make sure that we make this place a safer place to live for our kids and our grandkids to grow up and ensure that their kids won't stay here, that this university is here, that we all work together to make this place a better place to live and a better place for people coming here to visit because, there again, we are a tourist town to ensure that they are safe. And when they leave here, they tell somebody, we went to Nagadish, it was beautiful, I felt good, I felt safe, I could walk down the streets. I stopped at Longleaf Vista Trail, got out and walked, and I felt safe there. Um, and I humbly ask that you vote for me, number 77, Steve Pizant for sheriff. And I have to say one more thing. 
Happy birthday. My wife's birthday is today. Thank y'all. I began my police career 34 years ago, like I said at the beginning. I've been here, born here, and was born and raised in Natchitoches Parish all my life. Our roots run deep. My wife and I together have uh, seven children between us, nine grandchildren. That's what it's about. Uh, you know, whenever I look at those kids, I know I have the qualifications to do something about the crime that's going on in this parish right now. I feel like it's my, it's, it's, it's my calling to do something about it. I don't like the way things are going in this, in this parish with the crime problem we're having. I don't think it's right for us to leave that to our kids and grandkids. Uh, I think if you have uh, something, you, if you have a way of doing something and the training to do something and the knowledge to do something to make things better, I think you should do it. And that's why I'm running for sheriff. When I'm elected sheriff, I'll lead from the front. I'll have the respect of my office. And respect is something that's earned. Respect doesn't come with a position. And I've earned, I've earned that respect over the years. I'll continue uh, earning that respect with all of my deputies and, uh, and with the parish and with the public. Uh, vote number 78, Steve Rashow for sheriff. Thank you. Throughout my uh, work career, especially as a lawyer, I had several opportunities uh, to run for judge or run for the DA when Van retired, and it just didn't seem to fit. Just something, I, I don't know if it just wasn't any flexibility because you, you got to be, you, there's so many things you can't do, and, and you got to watch what you're doing, and I just needed a little bit more freedom to do things to help people. Uh, I just feel like uh, when you go to work in the morning, if, if you go to work and you do something that you think you, you're doing a good job, you don't mind getting up in the morning and go to work. I'm the first one at, at work every morning. I'm there by 6.30. I hate telling you all that because the phone's going to start ringing at 6.30 now. But uh, I'm the first one at work, and uh, we, we can work long hours, nights, whatever it happens. Uh, if there's an event, we're there to see that we can do the best we can for the parish. Um, I think that uh, with, with being sheriff, I think that uh, with the guys, by earning the, the respect of uh, probably 98% of the deputies, they're all behind me, and, and having the endorsement of, of Sheriff Victor Jones, having the endorsement of, of the ministers in, in Niagara's, and having the voters in Civic League endorse me, you know, that, that tells me something that, that people at least, you know, know that I'm doing a good job, that I'll continue to do a, job, do a good job. But what it says more than anything is that I can work with people. I can try to help people. If you've got a problem, you come and you talk to me. I may not be able to solve your problem, but I'll tell you the truth. I won't lie to you, and I won't put you off. Uh, there's a lot of things. Fortunately, I have a lot of tools that sometimes cause me a whole lot of extra work, but I don't mind doing that. Uh, my job as a sheriff would be to try to work with the district attorney's office, the judge's office, uh, the federal authorities, and everybody else. Uh, this is something I think I do pretty good, and it's something that I would, uh, uh, would really enjoy doing for the next uh, number of years. So I ask for everybody's vote. Um, I'm number 79. I tell everybody, how do I get everybody to remember the number 79? And, and I, a lot of times I'll say, what is one from 80? And some people say, 79. I said, remember that. I need, to, I need your vote. Thank you all again for being here this evening. Thank you for your participation in the Chamber of Commerce questionnaire. Just as a reminder for everybody in the room tonight and everybody watching from home or on their phones, wherever they are, these candidates' responses can be seen and read on our Chamber website. It's natchitoshchamber.com slash candidates respond. And you can see all of our responses from our sheriff candidates as well as our parish president and parish council candidates. Um, also as a reminder for everyone in the room tonight or everyone watching on their phones or TVs at home or computers at home, we will be here same place, same time tomorrow evening for our parish president and parish council candidates forum. Um, that is another one that the chamber decided was very important for our parish, so I hope that you will all make plans to attend and have your questions ready for those candidates. I want to thank you all again for being here this evening, and thank you for holding these guys accountable. Uh, good luck, everybody, in the race. We'll see you all tomorrow evening.